The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. So I'm going to talk about the modern epidemic of loneliness using wisdom as a behavioral vaccine. So this is our team. It includes faculty, staff, trainees. And I'm really fortunate and I'm blessed by having amazing colleagues who do all the work. I just give talks. So <laughs> we have a good division of labor. So I'm going to begin with what is an epidemic and what is a behavioral epidemic? You may not even have heard of this term before. Uh, then I want to focus on loneliness, the risk factors, biology, and health consequences. Next, I'll talk about wisdom. And finally, interve interventions for loneliness. Let me start with epidemics. What is an epidemic? If you open a dictionary, epidemic is defined as rapid spread of an infectious disease to a large number of people in a given population within a short time period. And the best examples, or the worst examples of epidemic are plague, cholera, smallpox. There's a long list of these diseases which killed millions of people from the beginning of humanity, practically. However, with modern medicine, we now have almost eliminated all of these epidemics, thanks to the antibiotics and vaccines that we have developed. Once the cause was identified as some infectious agent, we could find something that could take care and remove the cause. And partly as a result of that, the average lifespan has been increasing. The average lifespan in the US in 1900 was 45 years, okay? Today it is 80 years, and in a few decades it is going to be 90. So doubling of the lifespan in 150 years, that's almost un unimaginable. One of the main reasons was controlling these epidemics, both in kids and in later life. So that's all good news. That's if the lifespan has been increasing until recently, that is. For the first time since 1950s, the average lifespan in the US dropped. It dropped two years in a row. Why did it drop? Not because of plague, cholera, smallpox, not HIV, not Zika, not because of some new cancer, or because of some new heart disease. It dropped because of things like suicide. Suicide rates in the US have increased by 33% in less than two decades. In 1999, if you look at the rate, the middle line shows the average rate. The line above shows the line suicide rates for men, and the one below shows it for women. Men, of course, have a higher risk of committing suicide. But you'll see this marked increase in the rate of suicide in a short period of time. And this is across the age group, especially affecting the youth. The number of suicides in teenagers and people in the 20s has shot up markedly. You hear about suicide at age as young as 10 years. I mean, it's just horrible to even think about that. So there is something happening. Another thing that we are all aware of is the opioid epidemic. 
the number of deaths from opioid has skyrocketed. In 1999, there were about 8,000 deaths from opioid use. In 2017, that number had increased to about 48,000. So from 8,000 to 48,000 in less than two decades. Underlying both the suicides and the opioid is another epidemic and that's loneliness. Loneliness has been called a grand challenge. Loneliness and social isolation, they are related, they're somewhat different. I will talk about the differences in a slide shortly. But loneliness and social isolation are called silent killers. Studies have shown that they are as dangerous to health, if not more, than smoking and obesity. And this has been reported by a number of studies, uh, including our former Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. And then look at the next statistic. In the US, 162,000 deaths per year are attributable to social isolation. That's more than the number of deaths due to lung cancer or stroke. Wow. In the UK last year, they established a new ministry of loneliness. And one of the main reasons was not health, but it was actually business. They found that lonely workers cost the economy more than two billion pounds because of their sickness, the performance going down, uh, leaves, and so many other things. So they have established this new Ministry of Loneliness and several other countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and Canada, are in the process of doing something similar. So what we are facing today is not cholera, smallpox, but suicides, opioid abuse, and loneliness. There is something that is changing, and that is in recent years. Gallup does polls all over the world, and Gallup organization, they, they do pretty scientific polls of randomly selected representative population. So they have been looking at stress, worry, and anger in the US over 10 years. Every year they do the survey. In 2008, and now this is 2018, the last survey was available. The rates of stress, worry, and anger have increased anywhere from 25% to 40%. Just imagine. So what is happening that the whole society is affected by these behavioral catastrophes. So why is this happening? One is rapid globalization. Now, rapid globalization, the whole world actually has become much smaller. In many ways, that's great, because we can communicate with people any part of the planet instantly, right? So that has provided increased opportunities for people to travel to other places and help them. But it also means increased competition, which make, means more stress. Technology, it's an unimaginably fast growth of technology. Nobody would have imagined, really. I mean, it's hard to think about a time when we didn't have email, let alone Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, and these have become, and this is true all over the world. In the poorest countries, cell phones are available more easily than food. So again, the, so technology has been helpful in many ways, but also means considerable and stressful information overload. Social media. Again, it's hard to imagine a time when we didn't have all of these social media. And clearly, they have pluses. They have brought together people from across the world. But the minuses are also becoming obvious. They have so many adverse effects, especially on vulnerable people, especially the youth. So the result is social anomie with loss of connectedness. The changes in the last 20 years have been greater than the changes in the previous 200 years. And our brain is not really equipped to handle this new change because the changes are occurring every day. There is nothing stable now. 
Uh, it's interesting to note that actually there is a British historian named Faye Alberti. She said that the word loneliness did not exist in English language until 1800. The word that was used was oneliness. So what is oneliness? You are by yourself, but you are contented, you are happy. You don't mind being by yourself. That actually gives you from free time to do something. But in 1800, with the beginning of the industrialization, the things changed. And then that L got added to loneliness, it became loneliness. And what is wrong with loneliness? What is wrong with loneliness is it is distressing. I talked about loneliness and social isolation. They are related but different. Loneliness is subjective. I feel lonely. And what do I mean by that? That means I feel distressed because there is a gap between the social relationships I want and the social relationship that I have. For example, if I have five friends, five close friends, I may be happy because I have five is plenty and I can, but if I want 10, then I will be unhappy because I'm not having what I want. So that is, and that causes distress. And then I worry about myself that maybe I'm not able to connect with others. That creates fear about contacting others. And so that becomes a vicious circle and the loneliness increases. Social isolation is objective. You can measure it by counting the number of relationships. So somebody has 10 friends, five friends, 20 friends. That is social isolation. So if you are on an island where there is nobody else, or um, those who are in solitary confinement, obviously that is social isolation. No question about that. But loneliness and social isolation are different. You can be lonely in a crowd, like the stones in a dorm. They're surrounded by hundreds of stones, and yet they feel lonely. On the other hand, you may not be lonely in a cave because you are contented with yourself. You don't need others, right? So that's the difference. But both loneliness and social isolation carry significant risk to health and need different types of intervention. So we have been studying loneliness in one of the senior housing communities, and we interviewed these people, people there who, and asked them, what does it feel like when you are lonely? And these are the quotes, direct quotes from them. One said, it is kind of gray and incarcerating. I mean, that's such a powerful word, incarcerating. I would like to cry out for somebody. Another said, just feeling sort of empty or not really feeling belonging to someone. Another said, oh, ugly, just ugly. I'm very silent and would be away from everybody and everything. And finally, one said that I don't know what to do. I'm feeling lost and not having control. So that's the problem with loneliness. It makes you feel depressed, pessimistic, helpless. So what are the risk factors for loneliness? There is a good study of loneliness done in Chicago it is a part of Chicago Health, Aging, and Social Relations Study. So they looked at 225 adults from age 50 to 68. They found that education and income were negatively associated with loneliness. That is, people who are more highly educated and people who are affluent did not feel lonely, whereas people who did not have education are uh, who were in poverty felt more lonely. That's not a shock, of course. But they found that the racial ethnic differences, ethnic minorities felt more lonely, but that was not because of their ethnicity or race. That was because of the association with education and income. So there is no association between race, ethnicity, and loneliness. It is the secondary things like education and income that affect it. Being married and having positive marital relationships seem to offer the greatest protection against loneliness. And this is a consistent finding uh, in the literature. Other risk factors included male gender. Although that's not clear, some studies find that women have more loneliness, some find no difference. Physical symptoms, uh, chronic work stress and social stress, small social network, and poor quality social relationships. So you may have friends, but if, 
they're really not good quality, they don't help. Loneliness among college students. Again, they are surrounded by other students. And yet, they would feel lonely. So this is an online survey. And this is really interesting. We're talking about the parental relationship and social media. The students who reported more frequent phone conversations with parents also reported more satisfying, intimate, and supportive parental relationship, whereas those students who contacted the parents through social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter, they had higher levels of loneliness, anxious attachment, as well as conflict within the parental relationship. And of course, I think here, the cause-effect relationship is both ways. If you are not close to your parents, you won't call them. You would rather contact them through Facebook. On the good relationship, you'll call them and talk to them. But then it becomes a vicious circle. So loneliness is uh, like other traits, neurobiologically based. In lonely person, there is less enjoyment from social interactions, and that is associated with less activity in certain brain regions, such as ventral striatum. So there is a blue area where there is less activity compared to non-lonely non people. There have been several studies of genes associated with loneliness, and a number of those genes are also associated with brain areas that are involved in emotional expression and behavior. So these are parts like prefrontal cortex, limbic striatum. And interestingly, and I will talk about that shortly later, is that these are the same areas that are also involved with wisdom, but of course, in the opposite direction. There's a large genetic study or genomic study of loneliness in UK. Nearly half a million people they studied. And they found that loneliness is a modestly heritable trait, about 50%. Actually, what is inherited is not loneliness per se. It is sensitivity to social pain. That is the inherited characteristic. And loneliness is a state that is affected by that. So that's why we may be more lonely at some time, less lonely at other times. But then by and large, some people tend to be lonely, others not. And interestingly, the genes associated with loneliness are also associated with heart disease, metabolic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and psychiatric disorders like depression, as well as high triglycerides and low HDL, the good cholesterol. So it is not surprising that loneliness is associated with a bunch of physical and cognitive disorders. It is associated with various cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, heart disease, depression, anxiety disorders. It would affect behavior, sleep, uh, use of substances like alcohol, which also increase the risk of those diseases. So loneliness can cause diseases because of the genetic association but also because lonely people are less likely to have a healthy lifestyle. If you're feeling lonely, you feel depressed, you're not going to do physical activity or exercise, right? There is clear evidence that loneliness increases the risk for depression and dementia. Two very nice studies done in UK. The first one was an Irish study of 5,000 plus people over the age of 50. They followed these people over a period of time, and they found that people who had greater loneliness and social isolation, or social isolation, either of those, they had a higher risk of developing major depression or generalized anxiety disorder two years later. And the second study, which is even more concerning, so this was almost 7,000 people who did not have dementia to start with. They were followed for six years. 220 of them developed dementia. And the risk was related to greater loneliness at baseline, and inversely with the number of close relationships and being married. So loneliness is not only associated with depression, et cetera, but it increases the risk of depression and dementia later on. This was all bad news, <laughs> right? <laughs> now it's time to think about some good news. And there is plenty of good news. So we published a paper last year. Uh, Ellen Lee, uh, an assistant professor, was uh, 
first author as well as some of my colleagues who are here, like Barton Palmer and Daniel Glorioso, were co-authors on this paper. This paper received wide um, publicity. It was on CNN, Headline News to BBC, and so on. It was a study of 340 people in San Diego from age 27 to 101. So it was almost the entire adult lifespan. And we used a scale called UCLA Loneliness Scale, which is perhaps the most widely used scale for measuring loneliness, 20 item scale. We found that in San Diego, America's finest city, right? I mean, this is <laughs> heaven. Three out of four adults felt lonely at some point, moderate to severe loneliness. And this loneliness, even moderate level, was associated with worse physical functioning, worse cognitive functioning, as well as other things like depression, anxiety, stress, so on. Loneliness and age had a relationship which was actually weird, that it was present throughout the lifespan, but there were three peaks of loneliness. In late 20s, mid 50s and late 80s. The best fit multiple regression model identified three factors for loneliness. So the three factors that went in the opposite direction, the three factors that reduce loneliness were wisdom, living with somebody, which is opposite living alone, and mental well-being. And the most significant of these three was wisdom. This is the association between wisdom and loneliness. I'll talk about wisdom, how we measured wisdom. So we have a rating scale for measuring wisdom, and we had a rating scale for measuring loneliness. So this shows loneliness. The higher the sc score, more lonely. And this is wisdom score. So higher the score means wiser you are. So people who had high scores on wisdom, on loneliness, they were very low. So they didn't have loneliness. And the correlation was minus 0.53. In behavioral research, correlation of 0.5 is pretty high. Usually you don't see that kind of correlation between two different behavioral measures. So what is wisdom, right? <laughs> wisdom is a personality trait. It's a personality trait like resilience, optimism, loneliness. But it is complex and it has different components. One component is self-reflection. The ability to look inside, analyze ourselves, our behavior. Compassion, empathy and compassion for others. Dr. Bill Mobley is here. He's um, director of the Neo $100 million uh, compassion center that UCSD um, uh, will be ha having. I mean, it's already started work. So I'm just delighted about that. So compassion is something obviously very important. But compassion is not just to other people. Compassion is also for self. So self-compassion is a part of that. Emotional regulation. How do you control your emotions and not throw temper tantrums or go into road rage? <laughs> Spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity. Spirituality is belief in somebody higher than ourselves, somebody beyond our thinking that exists, which makes us feel humble. And accepting diversity of opinions, diversity of perspectives, where I have some values, but I can understand why somebody else may have different values. That doesn't mean that either of us is either stupid or evil. So accepting the fact of having different perspectives for different people. So that is wisdom. So this is a combination of these traits, that's wisdom. So we developed a scale. Um, the paper was published earlier this year, the San Diego Wisdom Scale. This is a 24 item scale. And there are four items for each of the six components that I mentioned previously. 
And this is well validated. It has already been translated into several languages and uh, has been used in many studies. Just to give you examples of the sample, of, of the question. Now, some of the questions are positive, some are inverse question in the sense the answer is negative. Uh, I avoid situations where my help will be needed. So this is to test compassion. If you are compassionate, you will want to help others, right? So if you avoid situations in which your help is needed, that means you are not compassionate. Others look to me to help them make choices. So that's a sign of being useful to the society, giving useful advice. It is important that I understand the reasons for my action, self-reflection, think about yourself. I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. It's an indication of emotional regulation. When I'm, you're very upset, if you can't think about that, that's not good. So can you control your emotions? And I'm okay with others having morals and values other than my own. So that acceptance of diversity of perspective. So there are 20 items, 24 items like this. The whole scale takes about five minutes to complete. But as I said, it is reliable and valid, as we have shown. Like loneliness, wisdom is also neurobiologically based. And there are specific, re again, the brain is it's a very complex computer. So there is constant interaction among different areas. So it is simplistic to say that these are the areas that affect wisdom. That's not so. The whole brain is involved. However, some areas are more important than others. And those areas are prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral, ventromedial, anterior cingulate, and amygdala. An important question is, does wisdom increase with aging? And there is strong suggestion that it does. But does wisdom do anything else? So there is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom, which says that when grandma helps her adult daughter in raising her children, that adult daughter lives longer, is happier, and produces more children than the grandma did. And all three generations, the grandma, adult daughter, and the children, they have greater happiness, health, and longevity. This has been reported in bottlenose dolphins, killer whales, species of bird called Sechelis warbler, and humans. And these are papers published in the highest journals in science, such as Nature and Science. So this is not some feel-good TV science. It is actually hardcore science. Why it is important? The value of older people in the society. I mean, most of the time, older people are thought of as a burden on the society. We talk about silver tsunami, as if it's a disaster that people are getting older. Actually, the nature wants humans to grow older. And that's why humans live long after they stop being fertile, unlike other animals. So Darwin's law of survival of the fittest meant that animals would not live after they stopped being fertile. So for humans, the age of menopause or andropause in men is about 45, 50 years. So if you live to age 90, that means half of your lifetime, there is no fertility. Why do we live that? That is because of things like this, the grandmother hypothesis is a wisdom, that we don't produce children, but we help the younger generations be happy, healthy, and more fertile than the earlier one. So, so the finding I reported about correlation between wisdom and loneliness, that was in 340 some San Diegans. So whenever I present any data from San Diego, people from other parts of the country, they say, oh, that's San Diego population. <laughs> that's California, that doesn't apply. So we recently did a large study using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, this has 3,388 people from across the country. And we use the same scale for loneliness and wisdom. <coughs> and look at this, same correlation, minus point five one. So even sort of general, in the general population, we are seeing the same inverse relationship between loneliness and wisdom. And then we are just embarking on a new study. Uh, Danielle talked about that. This is called Chao, 
CHAO stands for Chilento Initiative on Aging Outcomes. So this is a wonderful collaboration between UCSD and University of Rome. Uh, Dr. David Brenner, our Vice Chancellor, is uh, beyond the San Diego side, and Dr. DeSoma, um, cardiologist and ER physician, and Chilento, beyond that side. And there are a number of us at UCSD who are involved in this study. So we began with a small pilot study of 29 people over the age of 90 in Chilento, <laughs> and there are 51 children, age of 51 to 75. We found that those adults over 90 had better mental well-being than their children, although there was physical health. And we did qualitative interviews. And this is another paper that got wide publicity everywhere. Um, so this study reported that the Chilento nonagenarians had more positivity, they were worked hard, spirituality, and religiosity. Uh, born with family, religion, and land, resilience, and stubbornness. <laughs> that stubbornness elicited the most interest from the media. People said, oh, my family, stubbornness runs in my family, and that's good news for me. <laughs> so we recently, we started a second study, this. And this study now fo has focus, is focusing on loneliness and wisdom. So what we did was we this two scale that we have been using here, uh, UCLA three scale and uh, San Diego wisdom scale. These were translated into Italian. Uh, we had two medical students from Rome who came here, spent uh, three months of internship with us. They translated these into Italian, back translated into English, retranslated into Italian. So it's really well done study, and. This is what we found. So these are the Chilento people, younger ones, 50 to 65, and then over 90, and these are San Diego sample. There are some slight differences, but they are not significant. So these show the mean and standard deviation. So the point here is that in an entirely different culture, and by the way, the Chilento population is mostly rural, and they are much less educated than San Diego population. Only about 10% in that population has any college education. Whereas in San Diego, our study, SAGE study, Successful Aging Evaluation, about 90% have college, some college education, even one year. So the education and being from rural parts does make a difference. But still, the basic concepts do not seem to be different, supporting that they are biologically based. So that is loneliness, this is wisdom. Again, similar thing you find that there is not a significant difference among these groups. But the main finding was, again, this loneliness versus wisdom. So these are the four groups. These are the Chilento 50 to 65, Chilento nonagenarians, San Diego 50 to 65, San Diego nonagenarians. Same thing everywhere. This inverse correlation between loneliness and wisdom, anywhere from minus 0.522 to minus 0.755. That is huge. That is huge for any study, especially for a behavioral study. So what this means is that there is something we can do. Wisdom is a potentially modifiable trait. And that's what makes this interesting and positive. So the last part of my talk is then, how can we, what can we do for loneliness? So, the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, and I give them a lot of credit, starting in 2015, they talk, started talking about loneliness. What a epidemic and what a social disaster it is. So they have started a campaign to end loneliness they're focusing on older age. However, loneliness is not restricted to older age. Loneliness is common across age group, including children uh, and uh, adolescents and others. So the interventions are of different types. So why are people lonely? Because they have sometimes difficulty in establishing social connection. 
Sometimes you try something and that doesn't work out. You go to a party, uh, talk to a couple of people, you come out and you feel terrible about yourself. So I really didn't connect with others. There's something wrong with me. And so that is maladaptive social cognition. Because if you carry that feeling, then it becomes a vicious circle. Then you are less likely to talk to others, right? And then that reinforces your feeling of being lonely and socially isolated. So how do you address that? So that has, you have to do something like cognitive behavior therapy. Actually, Dr. Eric Granholm, who is here, he has done pioneering work in this area of cognitive behavior therapy. Improving the social skills. And this can be done in different ways. You can teach people, you can have them practice in a group. Uh, you can have role models, play acting, and number of different ways in which you can do that. Increasing the opportunities for social interactions. This is important. Um, right now we are doing several studies with senior housing communities in San Diego. Um, and these senior housing communities, there are continuing care communities, independent living, assisted living, and memory care. In many of these independent communities, independent living communities, there are a number of social interactions. They have a common dining room. They have a gym. They may be a movie theater. So there are opportunities for social interaction. But not everybody uses them. So you need to make sure that you can talk to people and see that they find those opportunities useful for them. And enhancing social support. Really, one cannot exaggerate the importance of social support. One of the best protectors against things like depression and dementia is social support which leads to intergenerational activities. Dr. Peter Whitehouse, who is here, has done some remarkable work in this area. There is a study that was done a number of years ago that was funded by MacArthur Foundation. That's called Experience Core. What they did was they took some older adults over the age of 65 who had retired, and they had to agree to spend at least 15 hours a week in a public elementary school in downtown. So these are the schools where most of the kids come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. They don't have grandparents, sometimes not even functional parents. Uh, overcrowded classrooms uh, and really not much attention given to them. So these older people had to spend at least 15 hours a week working as mentors and tutors to en enhance their literacy development, the reading, writing, arithmetic, but also behavioral management skills. If a kid didn't do well in math, in one exam, then why did you not do well? Maybe you didn't understand, or you didn't uh, tell the teacher that you had some problem. So how do you manage that? After the one year, and actually they had a control group in the study, which of older adults who did not have these intergenerational activities. So, so in these schools, these kids' grades went through the roof. They did very well in their classes. They were also very happy. But importantly, the older people, and this is really rem remarkable, their mental health improved, not, sur not a surprise. Physical health improved. But what is interesting is their biomarkers of stress and biomarkers of aging in blood and urine improved compared to the control group. And the most amazing thing is the volume of the hippocampus on brain MRI was larger in these people than in the controls. Hippocampus, as you know, is the area that is responsible primarily for memory, or one of the most important areas for memory. 
And that's something that is affected in a major way in Alzheimer's disease and many other dementia. So just think about that, this intergenerational activity, I don't think that it increased the volume of hippocampus. What it did was it prevented the decline that occurred in the control group. But even that is remarkable. Another intervention would be converting the loneliness into oneliness. In the sense that if you are alone, what's wrong with that? That actually you can allow yourself to check in with yourself because that's the time that you get for yourself, which is, doesn't happen too often, right? It makes you think. Um, you don't have to do anything else but think. It helps you enjoy time alone inspires to get active, pushes you to reach out, and opens up your creative side. So if we could help people when they're alone, not to feel distress, and not to feel that there is something wrong with them, that if they're alone, that means others don't want to be with them. That's not the case. It is their choice to be alone. And then they're going to make the best use of the time alone. If you take that perspective, you'll find that it is much more useful than the distress and depression and anxiety that go with loneliness. So wisdom. So how do we use that wisdom for reducing loneliness? Because they go in the opposite direction. If you're wise, you're not likely to be lonely. So the question is, how to, can you become wiser? Is wisdom something you are born with and then stay stable? The answer is no. Um, wisdom is a potentially modifiable trait. Unlike IQ, IQ you can't change too much. I mean, you can change some through better teaching, uh, better support, but you can't increase it. Wisdom, on the other hand, so actually Ellen Lee and I, we recently reviewed the literature on interventions to increase components of wisdom, like emotional regulation, spirituality, compassion, and there are randomized control trials that show that you can do that. In real life, what we want is practical wisdom, which means making wise decisions on a daily basis. We're not talking about big decisions that change life. We're talking about small decisions. How long do we take to go to work? Then how do we interact with this? If my paper is rejected, what do I do? to? deal with it, how do I start preparing? So these are the sort of small decisions that don't change your life, but they are important. If every one of those decisions can have self-reflection, emotional regulation with contentedness, empathy and compassion, including self-compassion, decisiveness while accepting diversity of perspective and spirituality, if you can incorporate these elements into almost any decision, we will be much happier. And it seems like too much work, and how can we do that? Well, it's a question of just making it a habit, right? Once it becomes a habit, so every time we become very annoyed and angry, there's a time to think about controlling the emotions, for example. So if we practice that, things will change. The first step in the process of becoming wiser is honest self-reflection. You know, I talked about those different components of wisdom. And I don't think there is anybody, or probably there are a few people, but most people are not great in every one of those. For example, my wife is much more compassionate and empathic than I am. So um, on the other hand, I might probably um, be um, somewhat more decisive when it is needed. Um, and so we need to I need to find out where I'm strong and where I'm weak. And I need to focus on the things that I need to increase. But ultimately, wisdom is a balance. None of these things in extreme is good. For example, if I'm very compassionate, I would give away everything I have, and then I won't have enough to survive. If I'm too self-reflective, I spend all of my time just thinking about myself, then I'm not very productive, all right? Um, if uh, I'm too accepting of different perspectives, then I will not have my own perspective. That's not good. If I'm too emotionally regulated, I become like a zombie or a robot, right? So this is what is required is balance 
And we need to find out where we need the balance more and we focus on those areas. Self-compassion. Again, everybody knows the importance of empathy and compassion. But it's interesting that people who are compassionate to others sometimes are overly self-critical. If my friend does something wrong, I say, oh, that, that's okay, everybody does that. But if I do that wrong, I have sleepless nights, and why did I do that? Why didn't I do something better? Uh, and the common situations are interview, you know, go for a talk, date, party. Um, let's say I'm giving this talk. After the talk, I'm sure there will be some questions, and there may be one or two questions that I don't answer well. And then I can't go back and just keep on thinking about that, that those questions I just didn't answer well. What did I do wrong? Instead of thinking about that, the overall, actually, the whole evening was great. I got to meet with wonderful people, and I had great time. So how do you do that? So one is self-kindness. So instead of being too judgmental about self and too critical about self, we need to be Just as I would be kind to my friend, if my friend came and said, that he gave a talk, that he couldn't answer the question. I will say, don't worry. Who will remember those questions and your answers next day? But I need to tell that to myself, right? Another is mindfulness, in which I say, OK, I'm feeling somewhat anxious or sad about something, or I didn't do well, but that's OK. I will get over that. And sense of common humanity, everybody does it. Tell me a person who hasn't made a mistake, right? So I'm one of them. So, I, so what is important is, again, self-compassion. Again, to some extent, some people have too much of self-compassion. Then that becomes a problem. <laughs> then they need to be compassionate to others. Right? Emotional regulation, road rage. Common problem in California, right? <laughs> <laughs> On the highways. Uh, you know, you're going, you're late to work, you're rushing. And somebody just cuts in front of you. Gets so mad. How could he do that? And start honking, start cursing him, and shouting, screaming. And you really lose it. You lose it, right? So what do you do when something like that happens? I mean, it is stressful. Somebody cut in front of you because that slows you down. You're going to be late for it. So one is deliberate effort to reinterpret the meaning of a distressing event. So you think about why that person cut in front of you. It is not because he was just trying to overtake you. Maybe because there was a child in the back seat of his car, and maybe the child suddenly had seizure, or the child threw up, or the child something seriously happened. If you were the parent, wouldn't you do the same thing? You would rush to go to the emergency room or someplace. So what is wrong with that? So, so that sort of let's say, rationalize the motivation of somebody else right? who did that. And there is distraction. Change the focus. Don't think about that driver. Increase the volume of the radio. Think about or the music you like and focus on that. Or just label. Just say, OK, I'm feeling angry at that. And that's absolutely appropriate because somebody cuts in front of me. But that's OK. I'll get over this emotion. I will move on. This happened. So if we do that once, twice, thrice, then slowly it will become the second nature. In the last few minutes, I want to talk about sort of broader implications. I mean, I started the whole talk by discussing the behavioral epidemics and what's happening to the society, that the level of stress, anxiety, Depression is increasing, suicides are increasing, opioid abuse is increasing, social isolation is increasing. And all these are killers. They don't just make you feel bad, they are killing people. And that's why the average lifespan has dropped. I mean, just it's un unimaginable that with all the modern medicine we have, it has dropped. And that's because of this thing. There is something wrong with the social, and this is not just you, I mean, this is globally what is happening in the last two decades, right? And more so, again, in the last few years, probably 10 years, four years, whatever. And we saw that 
th 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 that is what is causing actually these problems, and yet we are not aware of that. And the reasons are like globalization, technology, social media. They are not going to go away, right? The question is, how do we adjust to them, and how do we help our brain get used to this rapidly changing society in the face of anomie? And especially, we need to focus on youth, because that's where the biggest problems are. As I said, the suicides are increasing in um, teenagers and people in their 20s, as young as now 10 years. So what is needed is wise parenting and grandparenting. And a number of studies have shown that actually wise parenting and grandparenting reduce the incidence of later life psychosocial and health problems, including physical health problems. But of course, parents need to serve as role models. The parent can't throw a temper tantrum and expect the child not to do that, right? Family discussions at dinner. And family discussions which are not to criticize somebody, oh, that you did something wrong, or that, not like that, but sort of how should we function? Or when something works well, how did it work well? What did we do right that we can do at other times? Work, clearly, working with the school teachers is important because then the teachers and the parents, they are conveying the same message, same way. And intergenerational activities. They like cannot overstress the importance of intergenerational activities. They're useful for both generations. The kids need that because they need the wisdom of the older people. Uh, you know, the kids, they are a lot of energy, but th th their concentration is um, not very high. They're distracted. They're, and when they see an old wise person calm, whom they can go, he can, or she can help um, them solve the problem, that's much better. But for older people also, I mean, if you talk only with other older people who are all complaining about their physical ailments and how the society is going downhill. I mean, it looks very depressing. So it's great to have some kids who have a lot of energy, enthusiasm, excitement. They're doing something. And so, so that becomes infectious, right? So we can help each other, young, younger and older generations. And going beyond childhood, workplace. The number of suicides is increasing in medical students, law students, engineering students or send physicians. This has become a major problem on the medical side, medical students as well as physicians. And one of the reasons for actually, or one of the main parts of the compassion center that Dr. Mobley uh, is heading is some well-being training for the medical students. And not just medical students, I mean, this needs to, obviously this applies to undergraduates, uh, and graduates and others too. I think the problem in what we do today is in schools, we focus on three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and in professional schools, we focus on hard skills. For example, you teach a physician, physician to be, how to be good at diagnosing illnesses and in treating them. So we become experts in looking at an MRI and exactly localizing the lesion and then exactly deciding how much radiation would one need. That's great. I mean, that's our job, and we got to be able to do that. But aren't soft skills also important? Things like compassion, compassion about the patients, regulating your emotions. Physicians get upset if the patient did not take the treatment properly, forgot to take his medication. How could you do that? You know, you're supposed to do that. How are they? Again, we need to control our emotions. We need to self-reflect. Because physicians also are patients at other times. How did we handle that? And should we not give the same courtesy to the patient? Right? So the soft skills, and the soft skills also include self-compassion. And medical stones, again, there is Sometimes there is too much self-criticism, which becomes a problem that leads to increased risk of suicides. So the soft skills of emotional regulation, compassion, self-reflection, spirituality, those are also needed to be transmitted. And where should it be done? Professional schools. 
businesses. And last one, politics, I put a big question mark. <laughs> That's, we can only hope. So, so we know that the traditional infectious epidemics, they required antibiotics and vaccines. So the behavioral epidemics need behavioral vaccines. Behavioral vaccines like resilience, the ability to handle stress, overcome stress, cope with it, and not just cope with it, but survive and grow from that, right? Post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress disorder. Social support. Again, this value cannot be overstressed. There are something like 150 studies of social engagement and social support that have been published that show that social support increases longevity with an effect size that is equal to or greater than using statins, stopping smoking, and doing exercise. So social support is one of the best medicines we can give. And last but not least, of course, is wisdom. I mean, just think about that. If most people had self-reflection, emotional regulation, <clears throat> compassion, empathy, accepting diverse perspectives, decisiveness, social advising, we would not have these epidemics of suicide, loneliness, social isolation, uh, and opioid abuse. So, that's my last slide. So what we are trying to do, we hope to do at Stein Institute and with all of you uh, as partners in that, is making a stressed, lonely, and pessimistic society happier, healthier, and wiser. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.